Nick, I hand it over to you. Understood. Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to the Georgetown University War Gaming Society this evening. Uh, in preparation to give this talk this evening, I've watched over two dozen uh, of your posted videos. And I have to say, I certainly have some big shoes to fill. Hopefully I'll do that. Uh, this evening, I'm gonna talk about the design, development and implementation of War at Sea, which is a tabletop educational war game used at the US Naval War College. It's also found a home elsewhere. And I'll touch on that a little later. On the left of this initial slide, my cover slide, if you will, is an image of the cover of the War at Sea's rules document. I pointed out uh, because you'll see that there are two photos from World War II there, the upper left and center left. There's a photo from the Falklands War in 1982, and there's a photo of a Ticonderoga class cruiser launching a missile. Over the course of its development, rules were created to support naval combat in World War II, through the Cold War, to the present and into, this into the future. And, and that's something we're very proud of with respect to War at Sea. To the right, you'll see an image of the game itself, specifically the Falklands War scenario that we developed for the game. You'll see that the game is primarily played with cups of dice, with each colored die representing a type of military capability. Uh, that's probably the central conceit of the game, and I'm gonna go into that in greater detail later. Um, so sit tight on that. This is a brief agenda of what I plan to cover this evening. I'm gonna start with a brief introduction of myself. As was the case when I taught at the War College, I think it's appropriate for you to know a little bit about me, especially if we're gonna spend a few hours this evening together. From there, I'll spend just a few minutes talking about the War College itself as an academic institution, an institution with a long history of war gaming, and as the place in which to design and implement a war game today. I'll spend a few minutes talking about the cast of characters that was involved in that. And, um, uh, you know, it's a pretty interesting group of people, in my opinion. I said earlier that War at Sea is an educational war game. As such, every aspect of its design and gameplay should be focused on the student and the educational objectives wherever it's used. I'll describe those briefly, and then I'll move into describing the game itself. After a few different topics about the game, I intend to close our discussion with some thoughts on the game's impl implementation at the War College, the educational underpinnings of war gaming, and where at sea, excuse me, where war at sea is going next. So with that being said, that's me. I'm a 1996 graduate of the Naval Academy. I was a submarine officer. I served on two submarines. I lived in London, England, where I was an exchange officer with the Royal Navy. I lived in Japan, where despite being a submariner, I was attached to an aircraft carrier and served on the Admiral's staff. I'm a graduate of the Naval Postgraduate School, the Air Command and Staff College, and the Army War College. Immediately after graduating the Army War College, I transferred to the Naval War College, where I served on the faculty for the final three years of my military career. I retired from the Navy last fall after 24 years of active, active service. I'd like to point out that I'm still celebrating Navy football's win over Army this past weekend. It's always a good game to, to, play, to play and to win, uh, so go Navy. Um, I think it's also very important to point out that I am no longer formally connected to the War College. While the War College is central to my talk this evening, I now work as a defense contractor in Washington, DC. Anything I say this evening is my opinion, my recollection, and neither of those reflect the uh, official position of the War College or the US Navy. The Naval War College, located in lovely Newport, Rhode Island, was the first senior service educational institution in the nation and is world renowned for educating mil military leaders from all five US services and from dozens of other countries. The War College offers 19 different programs from five week courses to year long courses. And those are in a combination of in residence and virtual or distance learning courses. The War College is divided into six academic departments and numerous other smaller organizations. 
For the purposes of our talk tonight, I'm mainly going to talk about the JMO department. Um, but those other two uh, academic departments, the National Security Affairs and the Strategy and Policy, play a minor role. I would like to point out that I was a faculty of the Joint Military Operations Department, and War at Sea was designed specifically for use in the JMO department. The College of Naval Warfare is a year-long in-residence course designed for officers at the 18 to 22 year points in their career. I'm going to refer to it as the senior level course uh, for the rest of the evening. Likewise, the College of Naval Command and Staff is a year-long in-residence course for officers at the approximately eight to 12 year point in their career, which I'll refer to as the junior level course for the rest of the evening. Each of these programs is divided into trimesters and each of the three departments that I've shown here teaches a course for one of those trimesters in each of those two programs. So why do I bring this up? Why, in a talk that is supposed to be about the design, development, and implementation of a tabletop war game? Well, I would argue that a key aspect of designing a war game is understanding the environment in which it's going to be used. Uh, so some things to consider. One, the faculty of the JMO department teach during two trimesters of the year. And when they're teaching, they're averaging four days a week in the classroom for three or three and a half hours a day. So right off the bat, you know that their time is extremely limited. Instituting any change into a curriculum, such as, for instance, attempting to insert a war game into a course that was designed for use without one, is time intensive and laborious. Not only do course materials need to be adjusted, but faculty must be trained to play the game, trained to adjudicate the game, and trained most importantly to be used effectively as an educational tool in the classroom. Of course, before that can happen, a convincing case must, must be made to actually use the war game in the classroom. And that case is not as easily made as you might hope or imagine. It requires a long and intense PR campaign, especially when there are skeptics who don't see the value in wargaming or who don't believe that a game should be played in the classroom. And lastly, before you can build a case to convince people to learn a war game, you actually have to design that game. There's one other aspect of the war college that I think is pertinent to this discussion. The War College has a long history of wargaming. Following World War II, numerous admirals credited our victory in the Pacific to the wargaming that they did at the Naval War College in the years leading up to World War II. In the decades since World War II, however, wargaming has dwindled to a fraction of what it was previously at the college. And only recently, with the DOD's increased emphasis on wargame, is that beginning to change. But let me pause and clarify that comment. When I say that wargaming has dwindled to a fraction of what it was, I am specifically referring to wargaming in support of the education of the college's students. In fact, the wargaming department at the college runs over 50 events and games each year, but the vast majority of those events are held to support the chief of naval operations, held to support the Navy or the other services, um, held for a variety of reasons but typically not to support the student body. So to represent that graphically, the arrows here rising out of the wargaming department are meant to depict the scope of its support to CNO, the Navy, other services. The smaller arrows that are also coming out of the wargaming department to the other academic departments indicate my rough guess of my rough guess of the relative effort that is devoted towards supporting the other departments. Now, I can tell you that the Wargaming Department does support JMO. It assists with a multi-day exercise at the completion of the junior course, and, and it helps in other ways. And it certainly helps uh, with war at sea. I believe that the Wargaming Department has 
connections to the other academic departments? To be honest, I'm not sure, however. The problem with this support that starts at the Wargaming Department and ends at War at Sea is that that support is not necessarily hardwired and is potentially tenuous. Um, obviously, members of the, of the JMO Department work continuously to, to maintain that connection. And thus far, the Wargaming Department has supported that but it is always a concern how long that support will last. I'd be remiss if I didn't spend a few minutes talking about some of the people who are principally responsible for War at Sea. And you'll note that my name is third on this list because I would argue of the three primary contributors, I came to the project last and my contributions were only possible by working with and building on the work done by the other two. So very quickly, uh, Colonel Tim Pallage. Uh, Tim was a Marine Corps infantry officer, uh, a very impressive career, uh, including seeing a good bit of combat. He attended the Naval War College, graduated in 2017, and then stayed on and joined the faculty of the JMO department. During his year as a student, Tim took a wargaming elective and was blown away by the potential of wargaming as an educational tool. Now, having just worked through the JMO curriculum as a student, then new member of the faculty, Tim Pallage, felt that wargaming could make a powerful contribution to the course. He began working on that game as a side project while also honing his skills in front of the classroom. Although it was a side project that, uh, that quickly grew to take an awful lot of his time. But ultimately, and the key point here is that War at Sea is ultimately Tim's baby. Next, we have Dr. Larry Johnson. Larry's a retired Naval officer, a surface warfare officer, who after his career in the Navy came to the War College and joined the Wargaming Department. Larry is an expert in the design and development of war games and has worked on and supported numerous games over the years. He is an expert in war game mechanics, gameplay, student engagement, modeling, and all of the other skills that are really necessary to create a war game. I would tell you of the three of us, um, Larry is the Wargamer. And then lastly, you have me. I joined the faculty of the JMO department around the same time that Tim did. But to be honest, I didn't get to know him for several months. It wasn't until I walked past his open office door one day and saw a large map on his table. And I stopped in and I asked him, Tim, what are you working on? And he said, I'm working on a war game for JMO. And my immediate response was, you want some help? Thankfully, he said yes. Now, before I joined them, Tim and Larry had been working uh, and collaborating on War at Sea for a few months. They had been working uh, to generate some rules and start working on the first scenario, which in this case was uh, the Battle of Leyte Gulf, a, bottle, a battle fought in World War II in October of 1944, which is widely considered the largest naval battle in history. And I'll talk in a few minutes to why that scenario was chosen as our first scenario. But so here you have it, an infantry officer, a many years retired ship driver, and a submarine driver teaming up to create a war game. What could go wrong? Of course, that's an oversimplification. Numerous members of the JMO department insisted throughout the process, as well as other people from the wargaming department. Larry was not the only one. And those people, all of them, offered advice, assistance, acted as guinea pigs during play tested, asked hard questions, and poked holes in faulty assumptions. And there were others. There were people outside of the War College. Uh, and I'll talk to some of them as well. But ultimately, it was a team effort. So as I've stated a few times now, War at Sea was designed to be an educational war game used to support other classroom and seminar studies in an academic setting, specifically the senior and junior JMO courses at the War College. As such, the needs of those courses should be and were paramount in its design and development. Now, I apologize in advance because I'm about to show you a bit of an eye chart, but I'm gonna show you the course objectives for the two JMO courses. And I'm not showing them to you to impress you, and I'm not showing them to you to critique them, 
or attempt to quibble with them. It's not really our place to ask, are they the proper objectives? Do they really meet the needs of the Department of Defense? I can assure you that uh, those are debates that are commonly held amongst the faculty of the War College. But instead, I'm showing them to you to consider that as a designer of a war game, for an educational purpose, these need to be front and center in your thought process. I would further argue that if playing a game in the classroom doesn't support your educational objectives, you shouldn't be playing that game. Now, I believe that War at Sea did a very good job of supporting these objectives. As I said, it's a bit of an eye chart. I'm gonna pause momentarily just to let you scan those very quickly. Now, I highlighted in red areas that I felt, and I believe we all felt, that War at Sea could assist in the classroom. Now, I'm not arguing that playing a war game alone can achieve any one of these, but I do believe that playing a well-designed war game can contribute to every one of these, and in some cases, very strongly contribute to those. Digging one step deeper, but keeping all of those objectives in mind, we concentrated the game at the operational level of war, which is that level of war between strategy, the strategic level of war, and between the tactical level of war. And we concentrate on concepts of operational art and naval combat derived from these sources and the writings of others. Of course, as time went on and more people played the game and in different settings, we learned that in addition to operational art, in addition to naval combat, the game can be used to, taught, to teach leadership, communications, organization, and frankly, a bunch of other topics. Ultimately, it's up to the instructor to be able to teach to these topics and those others that he or she sees fit. So these are some of the topics that are pertinent to War at Sea. And in the hands of a capable instructor, students can play the game and have the potential to gain insights into all of these topics. Unfortunately, it's impossible to cover all of this material, but a good instructor who does choose to focus on these aspects in conjunction with the game can have great success in educating his students on them. This is the last side that I'm gonna talk about concerning the educational objectives of Ward C. But it's important to understand uh, for several of the decisions that we made in the design of the game. Both the senior and junior courses rely on two primary case studies to teach core concepts, the Battle of Leyte Gulf and the Falklands Malvinas War. As an example, students might read about operational factors, time, space, and force, or centers of gravity, and then be assigned portions of the given case study to provide real world examples of those concepts. Class time would include an academic discussion of the concept and then delve into the case study to discuss the real world applications of that concept. And this has proven for many, many years to be an effective instructional method. Talk about a concept, read about the concept, read about it in the case study, and then Consider that concept in light of what you've learned in the case study. It's a very effective instructional method. But it does suffer, I believe, from one drawback. And that's what I call the hindsight 2020 conundrum. And the conundrum is this. Is it really possible to effectively teach about a decision when your students are aware of the range of choices, the actual decision that was made, and the outcome of that decision? especially when the outcome typically clouds the view of the decision. If it turned out well, it must have been the right decision. And if it didn't turn out well, well, it must have been the wrong decision. I would argue that's not necessarily the case. My point is that it's very easy to critique the actions and decisions of military leaders from history. 
And so perhaps there's a better way to teach about decisions and decision making. Now, because those case studies already existed in the curriculum and formed the basis for a great deal of course material, we decided to design the game initially around World War II naval combat, and we built our first scenario based on the Battle of Leyte Gulf. As you can imagine, our second scenario was in fact the Falklands War. I told you at the very beginning that I was gonna talk about the design, development, and implementation of war at sea. And I'm gonna do that, but I felt that it's important to understand the environment in which that game was developed. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the war college itself. And I talked about some of the key players involved. And since War at Sea is educational, I think it's important to understand the education that it was meant to support. And so I've talked a little bit about that. I'm gonna to turn to the game itself next, but before doing that, I wanted to pause and ask Sebastian, are, are there any questions now or should I just press? We only have two quick questions. Uh, first is how do DOD organizations uh, outside the Naval War College acquire a copy of the Naval, uh, um, Naval War College's War at Sea? So um, that is a great question. I think there are a couple different avenues uh, that could be followed. One, um, contact the Naval War College, contact the JMO department um, and, and ask for one. Or additionally, um, you could contact me directly and, and we can put a set together. And I'll be very honest with you. Um, I did this for the Naval Academy, and I'm going to talk about that a little later on. Um, to put together one full set of the game, which is uh, enough, the, the rules and all the pieces, parts, and artifacts to play a single scenario, including game maps and other um, pieces, parts, you're probably talking approximately $500. Um, I can tell you that dice. When, when purchased in bulk are very cheap, but dice purchased in less than bulk tend to be a little more expensive. But uh, what's the next question, Sebastian? I definitely under, empathize with uh, the cost of putting game sets for, together for people. Um, the next question says, can you describe the sources used for combat result tables if you use those and other historical data or modeling or subject matter expertise that you leverage in developing or in researching the game? I'll tell you what, that's a great question. Um, and I'm not going to answer it now because I'm actually going to get to that in some of my formal remarks a, later, a little later on. So um, Sebastian, hold me to it. If I don't answer all of the pieces, parts of that question, um, feel free to ping, with, ping on me again. But I believe that I'll be answering that a little later. No problem. I'll pin it. Uh, the next question says, uh, was there ever a discussion of a tactical level game for even more junior officers? I, I'm assuming sort of like J.O. levels, like you know I mean? ensigns and uh, lieutenants in the fleet. Uh, absolutely, as a matter of fact. Um, and I would also submit to you that some have argued that our game as currently built is almost too tactical. Uh, but with that being said, we have created a couple offshoots of War at Sea um, that were at least for a time, and I can't speak to today, but were for a time actually used at the War College. Um, and I have several ideas on how to create other tactical games. I will also add that um, the Service Warfare Officer School which is another Navy school, uh, very close, in fact, co-located in Newport with the War College. They have taken the general mechanics of War at Sea and adopted it to a game specifically to teach young junior surface warfare officers, excuse me, surface warfare officers, um, fundamentals of surface warfare. So in short, three answers to that, one, the War College has one or two things that might be applicable to, to more junior officers. Two, I have several ideas on additional things that we can do. And three, the Service Warfare Officer School has already done that for Service Warfare Officers. One last question before we press is, have you looked at including the Kalimantan uh, exercise? 
<laughs> I'm assuming that that question is coming from one of my former Naval War College faculty compatriots. Uh, and I would Please. suggest, I would tell you that the answer is yes, we have. And in fact, uh, I have volunteered to assist some of my former colleagues in working on that very scenario. Over. Perfect. Uh, you can press on, Nick. Okay. I appreciate that, Sebastian. Thank you very much. So for the next few minutes, you're going to see a diagram of the game on the right side of your screen, which is basically a, war a bird's eye view of how a classroom or a seminar would be set up for play. Ward C can be played with any number of players, but it was designed for two teams of six to eight players. And that number comes from the seminar size in the JMO course, typically somewhere between 14 and 16 students. So you would take that seminar, cut it in half right down the middle and assign those students to one side or the other. Now, the other thing you'll see looking at that screen is that is in fact the Philippines. And so that is the game map that we used for the Philippine, the Leyte Gulf scenario. Each team is led by a team captain, what we call the operational commander. Uh, and he leads a team of several, again, what we call tactical commanders. Typically each tactical commander controls specific forces in the game, while the operational commander oversees the efforts of all of the other players. And the operational commander is also responsible for developing the operational idea, which is basically his or her plan to achieve the military objective set forth in the scenario. A large partition separates the two teams and the game is double blind, meaning that players from each team have their own game map, are only certain of the locations of their own forces and don't ever see the game map of the opposing team. Now the decision to make Ward C double blind was made very early in its design. And I think it was a good decision. It absolutely, in my opinion, enhances the educational experiences of the students playing it. However, uh, making the game double blind comes at a fairly steep cost. And I'll talk about that a little later. The only instance where a player from one team will see face-to-face -face a player from the opposing team is during combat. Combat occurs at a battle table where a single tactical commander from each team reports to wage combat against a member of the other team and that individual's forces. The game maps are 48 by 60 inches on a side. We wanted a large map so that a team of six to eight players could stand around it, discuss, debate, argue over what they should do and why, and then take the appropriate action. At the same time, we didn't want a map that was so big that it would be unwieldy or wouldn't fit on a table. And we found that four feet by five feet was a good size. We also found that uh, a table of that size really promoted students standing around and arguing and learning from each other uh, about the scenario at hand. I'm going to go one step further and say that this aspect of the student interaction is extremely important. In a seminar setting, the students learn more by discussing and debating with each other often than they do from listening to the instructor. And a map of this size certainly contributes to that when playing the game. I'll even go one step further the interactions between students on the same team and the nature of those interactions in this wargaming setting can also provide learning opportunities. Lessons can be learned merely from observing and noting how students interact with each other in times of making decisions, in times of being under stress, in times of trying to figure out just what the heck we're gonna do next. A capable instructor in that classroom can draw very valid and valuable lessons from those types of interactions. We decided upon a map scale of one inch equals 20 nautical miles. By extension, the game maps cover an area of 1200 by 960 nautical miles. Now you can argue whether or not it should be smaller or it should be larger. 
But we found that this provided a fairly happy medium and provided a good size operational area to contemplate the operational level of war. If you zoom in, if you zoom in too much more, excuse me, if you zoom in too closely, the game quickly becomes tactical. And if you zoom too far out, the game risks becoming strategic. So we felt that this scale was effective. Now, if you put all that together, it looks something like this in the real world. Here you can see students playing in a room on a checkerboard floor. That is one of the wargaming halls in Sims Hall. And you may have seen pictures of pre-World War II wargaming at the War College. Much of that wargaming occurred in Sims Hall. And the fact that we can play the game in Sims Hall provides our students a nice link to the past. Finally, I want to speak to you about the role of moderators, facilitators, and umpires in playing War at Sea. I'll start with the moderators. In the JMO course, each seminar has two instructors. Typically, one instructor will take the lead teaching a given day's lesson, but both instructors are almost always in the classroom with the students at the same time. And this promotes good discussion, it promotes different points of view, even from the faculty, and it really contributes to a uh, effective conversational style that leads to deeper discussions and deeper insight. You'll see that there's a moderator with each team when playing War at Sea. The role of the moderator during game time is to observe, record the events of the game, be prepared to link the happenings on game day with the desired educational outcomes from the course. They're also present to answer questions as necessary. And this leads me briefly to mention a concept that I'll get into a little more, uh, a little later. The moderators are devoting their time and attention during the game to the learning to be derived from gameplay. They are concentrating on what the students are learning and how and why. And they're gonna take what they observe during the game and prepare to discuss that in a debrief after the game. Remember, the sole role of the moderators is to ensure the successful education of the students. That is their sole and most important role. Next, you have the facilitators down there at the bottom. Facilitators concentrate solely on game mechanics. They're running the game. They are the white cell, they are the adjudicators. They, more so than the moderators, have to be experts in war at sea. Now, facilitators are absolutely required in a double blind game, at least as war at sea is concerned and how it's designed and supported. And it would be impossible to run war at sea without them. The diagram indicates the presence of two facilitators. And I would argue that having two is the best case scenario because that lessens the cognitive load on each of them and it ensures that the game flows quickly and as efficiently as possible. Now it is possible to run the game with one facilitator, but that individual has to be really skilled. And frankly, there aren't many that are good enough that I believe we felt comfortable, at least when I was there, putting them in front of students. Now, earlier I mentioned the steep cost of running a double blind game. And this is that cost, manpower. Training effective facilitators is time intensive. Facilitation is a perishable skill. And quite frankly, on game day, it is tiring. Having enough facilitators to run games for 16 or 18 seminars is difficult, especially if those games would be run on the same day. Finally, the diagram indicates an umpire at the battle table. The umpire oversees combat, adjudicated by players rolling their respective dice against each other. Usually the role of umpire is filled by one of the moderators. Now, I'm gonna to speak to the, about the combat mechanics shortly, but we found that the role of the umpire, whether it is an umpire or a moderator acting in that capacity, is absolutely necessary to ensure that combat in the game runs quickly and we want combat to run quickly. 
because frankly, the great power of the education provided by War at Sea happens not at the battle table, but around the game map in those conversations and discussions between teammates. But before I talk about combat, I have to talk about the central conceit of the game. Now, I believe that the credit for this goes to Larry Johnson, but the conceit that I'm referring to is the decision to represent forces with dice, or quite often in the game, cups of dice. If you've played enough different games, you've probably become aware of the concept of a dice pool, meaning a pile of dice to represent some aspect of the game. It's not a unique concept in game design, and you can find it in all sorts of games, uh, commercially available and elsewhere. But we felt it was very effective at contributing to the understanding of important concepts, specifically at the operational level of war. Dice in War at Sea represent operational capabilities. And I'll talk about, that a, talk about that in a moment. But dice were specifically chosen to actively engage players and for their ability to quickly, at a glance, represent differing types and amounts of military capability. The cup with its dice inside, this cup specifically, represents a naval force. In this case, attack group Baker, which was a naval force that, uh, a, an American naval force that was involved in the Battle of Leyte Gulf. The cup and the dice inside represent all of those ships in attack group Baker, the cruisers, the destroyers, the aircraft carriers, etc. Each die, however, does not represent a single ship, but in fact represents a discrete amount of military capability present in that force. In actuality, a single ship contributes a small percentage of a green die, a small percentage of a red die, potentially a small percentage of a blue or uh, purple die. But all the dice in the cup represent the aggregated total of all of the military capability contributed by all of those platforms in the cup. So what does that really mean? To answer that question, let's talk about amounts of dice. Having more dice is always better than having fewer dice. The number of dice present at a given time represents the amount of a given capability that's present. So if a force is represented by a pile of dice, the force with more dice is militarily more powerful than the force with less dice. Now with that probably obvious point out of the way, let me repeat, a given color of dice represents a specific military capability, or put another way, a specific type of military or combat power. The use of dice allows us as game designers to abstract away the specifics of that capability and I would argue that's okay because at the operational level of war, I don't really care how at the tactical level, a given unit is made up in terms of its military capability. But let me provide some specific examples of what I'm talking about. In war at sea, green dice represent service fires. And service fires include such things as the rounds that are fired by a five inch gun on a World War II era destroyer. Or perhaps the rounds fired by the 16 inch guns on an Iowa class battleship. Or perhaps the five inch gun on a modern destroyer. And frankly, all other types of guns on naval vessels. But service fires, i.e. green dice, also represent ground-based artillery, in this case from World War II all the way, and depending on your scenario, to the present day. A green die always represents a specific amount of surface fire's capability. Red dice, on the other hand, represent anti-air point defense capability, anything used by a ship or ground forces to shoot aircraft out of the sky. Real-world examples of this capability include various shipboard anti-aircraft cannons, shown in the picture there, again, from World War II, to ground-based 
anti-aircraft guns, again, from World War II, or perhaps the phalanx close-in weapon system, which is present on almost all modern American naval combatants. Again, red dice represent anti-air capability. Now, War at Sea uses 10 colors of dice, although not all colors are used in every scenario. And in some cases, what the dice represent changes from scenario to scenario. For example, you can see there that black dice are special fires. In the Leyte Gulf scenario, black dice represent Japanese kamikaze aircraft. In the Falkland scenario, however, they represent Exocet anti-ship missiles. Another example is the orange dice, which are long-range strike. In the Leyte Gulf scenario, orange dice represent long-range bombers. However, in present-day modern scenarios, we use them to represent Tomahawk cruise missiles. So again, why dice? Because they represent, at a glance, a measure of combat power. As players learn the colors, they can look at a pile of dice and understand that this force has a lot of service fires capability, or a lot of anti-submarine warfare capability. Or, for instance, that it doesn't have any, any anti-air capability, meaning it doesn't have any red dice. And therefore, it might be vulnerable to attack from the air. In addition to providing a quick understanding of relative combat power, dice are also used directly to adjudicate combat. When two opponents approach each other at the battle table, they have their respective dice with them. In this case, the player on the left, if he has that pile of dice on the left, is probably feeling pretty confident going into this combat. The player roll their dice against each other and must roll a certain value to score a hit. A hit against your opponent allows you to remove from the game one of your opponent's dice. A player can only roll dice against his opponent depending on the tactical situation. Certain dice can only sit, only, excuse me, only hit certain other colors. For instance, red dice, as I previously mentioned, represent anti-air capability. If your opponent has no aircraft in the sky, you're not allowed to roll your red dice. And again, you can only roll purple dice, which represent anti-submarine capability, if you're in combat against submarines. So let's assume that these two piles of dice represent groups of surface ships during World War II running across each other at night. Because it is 1940s at night, the two forces are only allowed to employ their surface fires. They're only allowed to use their green dice in that combat. So the players will bring both those piles of dice to the battle table, but they're only able to roll their green dice because of the tactical situation that they're in. If you look closely, you can see that the force on the left has five green dice, while the force on the right has only one green die. The left player will be able to roll all five of his dice. And unfortunately for him, the player on the right is only able to roll that one die. So if the player on the left is lucky and scores five hits, he can completely eliminate the forces on the right. And at best, the force on the right can only eliminate one die from his more powerful opponent. Combat in the game is governed by combat tables that are posted at the battle table for players to reference in real time. Now, players are not expected to memorize these tables because the tables are unique for each scenario and each team. The tables delineate every combination of dice that can hit and what they can hit. Any number of that appears in this portion of the attack table that is not a dash indicates a hit. And some hits can inflict significantly more damage through an additional roll of the dice. In this case, as you see here, submarines and kamikaze fighters have the potential to be devastating in combat. So for the last few minutes, the heading on the screen has read the role of combat in a war game. And to this point, I've been talking about our combat mechanic, but not necessarily the role of combat. I wanna briefly do that now. 
And the meat of this discussion really gets to war game design. And, and in our case, designing a game to achieve specific educational objectives. I'd like you to consider a couple questions. First, what is the role of combat in a war game? What is its purpose? And second, is combat necessary for a war game to be effective? Now, I think the first two questions are really paraphrases of the same thing. And I think that there are probably a bunch of possible answers to that question. And I'll offer one, perhaps the simplest, why war game? What is the role of combat in that game? Well, because it's fun. Who doesn't like rolling dice and destroying his enemy? Conan said it best when asked what is best in life, to crush your enemies, to see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentations of their women. Amen. And that works for games specifically and purely for entertainment. But is it enough for professional games? Is it enough for an educational game like War at Sea? I do know that it can, that it can contribute to player buy-in. And player buy-in is important for professional and educational games especially if you have skeptical players or players who are having trouble difficulty grasping the more complex elements of the game, most people can understand rolling dice and most people can understand combat. Combat can also serve as an obstacle to a player or a team. They're attempting to achieve some in-game objective and an opponent stands in their way. How will that player or team deal with that obstacle? Well, they're going to have to weigh their options. And they're going to have to ask themselves, is the objective, whatever their objective is at that point in the game, worth engaging in combat? So combat can serve as an objective. Or excuse me, combat can serve as an obstacle. Combat can also serve as a cost. Players know that if they engage in combat, chances are that they're going to lose resources. Some games force combat specifically to drain player resources. Similar to the question, is it worth overcoming? Is it worth potentially losing resources to enter into this combat at this time? Finally, I would argue that combat is a forcing function. What does it force? It forces the players to consider the potential consequences of that combat. How will engaging in this combat, regardless of the losses I or my opponent take, impact my ability to follow my preferred course of action in the future? What actions could I take if I don't engage in combat? What actions should I take? And importantly, what is most important for my plan going forward? The choice to engage in combat and the potential repercussions of that choice have to be meaningful in a war game. Because in the real world, they certainly are meaningful. Now that brings us to the second question. And I think you probably all know the answer to this question. Is combat necessary for an effective war game? My answer is it depends. So more specifically, is combat necessary for war at sea to be effective? Yes, but. Let's talk a little bit about war game design and educational objectives, how the two play off of each other, and war at sea. In earlier versions of the game, there were up to four battle rounds possible for a given combat. And by battle round, I mean four rolls of the dice. In some cases, there were four. In some cases, there were two. Um, there were rules covering different situations. But there's a potential to roll the dice against your opponent four different times. Now, what was the benefit of that? The benefit of that is that it gave the tactical commander, i.e. that player getting to roll the dice, a lot of opportunities to make decisions. Should I roll my dice? Should I attempt to walk away? 
Should I bring in reinforcements, et cetera? And, and there are a number of tactical considerations that that tactical commander should consider. But what is the cost of those rolls of the dice? Frankly, time and lots of it. Two players standing at the battle table with everyone else in the room paused, waiting on the outcome. Not necessarily a great use of time. And another cost is rules complexity. When do you get four rolls? When do you get two? What are the trade-offs between how many dice you roll and when? More importantly, what is the trade-off between this benefit and this cost? Is it worth it? Well, the benefit was to the tactical commander. In a tactical situation, in a game war at sea that is supposed to be focused at the operational level of war. Was it worth it? No. So as the game developed, we dropped it to two battle rounds. Now that helped. Did it help enough? I believe that the War College is considering changing the rules somewhat and dropping combat down to only one battle round, only one roll of the dice. Now that will require some tweaks to the combat tables that I showed you earlier to make them more lethal to account for fewer opportunities to attract your opponent. But this change would also lead to a lot of rule simplifications. As I indicated, there are a bunch of rules that deal with the transition between battle rounds, employing reinforcements, various actions you can take. Are they necessary? In a game meant to be played at the operational level of war, I would argue that those tactical decisions perhaps aren't necessary. Furthermore, any opportunity to simplify the rules of a game and make the game easier to understand should be strongly considered by the war game designer. Ultimately, combat is a tactical action. And in a game that is meant to focus, excuse me, to focus on the operational level of war, detailed and complicated combat rules detract from the educational value of that game. It's more important to have teammates standing around the game map, considering the factors of time, space, and force, asking themselves if they've properly considered their and their opponent's center of gravity, considering the implications of sticking to their original plan in the face of en enemy resistance. They should be asking themselves if they are on track to achieve their intermediate objectives. They should be considering how best to employ their reserve. Spending a lot of time rolling dice to determine the outcome of a tactical action is not as important as those other things. The bottom line is this. War game design and gameplay should support the objectives of the game. In this case, it's educational objectives. If they don't, you as the designer of that war game should ask yourself if you've done a good job. And if you're the player of a war game, you should question the utility of that game to achieve your purpose. Let's turn our attention now to how we created the cups of dice used in Ward C. Remember, a cup of dice represents a collection of naval platforms and aggregates all of the combat capability inherent in all of those vessels. Larry and Tim spent a great deal of time researching the relative combat power of World War II era ships. And Sebastian, I think this goes to answer uh, the one question that was asked earlier. And what Larry and Tim did was they eventually arrived at the need to determine a baseline ship. And once a baseline ship was established, they could then determine the relative strengths of all other ships in the scenario. So what they chose was the battleship to be their baseline. Now, as you can see here, there, there were 24 different classes of battleship in existence during World War II. They looked at a very large number of those and they calculated the combat power across them. And then they basically arrived at an average. They calculated the throw weight of ordnance that could be delivered in 12 hours 
which is an in-game length of a turn in War at Sea. And that amount of ordnance, or surface fires in War at Sea speak, they equated to 0 0.8 dice. From there, they calculated dice equivalents of all the other dice colors for the battleship. And they arrived at these figures. And you can see that uh, on the diagram of the battleship, the individual objects on the battleship contributed to those various dice. They then calculated dice counts for other ship types. This is a typical World War II destroyer, for instance. And again, you can see the fractional amount of dice is different and a lot less than the battleship for the destroyer, with the exception of purple. And purple is anti-submarine warfare. One of destroyer's primary missions was to conduct anti-submarine warfare. And so they contribute some purple dice, whereas the battleship did not contribute purple dice. Now this is a bit of an eye chart, but it shows the dice counts for every ship type that exists in War at Sea in the World War II era. From here, creating a couple of dice is simply an exercise in arithmetic. The orders of battle for all the ships and most probably all World War II battles are part of the historical record, and they can tell us the number and type of each ship in a given formation. So the final step is to calculate the dice counts for each of those ships and then add them all up. Similarly, a, a similar calculation was conducted for ground forces and aircraft. So I spent the last, I don't know, 15 minutes talking about the game itself. More interestingly, I've tried to include a discussion or some discussions that lead toward war game design and some of the design decisions that we made in designing War at Sea. But you'll note that I skipped a ton of material about the game. I've not talked about a turn sequence. I've not talked about how forces detect each other or how movement or flight operations worked. I've not talked about vast aspects of this game. And I could talk for hours about those things, but that would probably kill you and it would probably kill me. Now, luckily for you, we did create tutorial videos that describe all of those aspects of the game. And at the close of my talk, I'll provide you a link to a YouTube channel that hosts those 13 videos. If you're interested in learning more about the game, you can go watch them on your own time. But right now, again, Sebastian, uh, I'm doing, I want to pause. Are there any questions that have come in since the last time we paused? Over. So I have a few questions. One that says, have you ever introduced uncertainty regarding the position or status of friendly forces within a, for, uh, within a team? That is a great question. And the answer is no. Um, you know, effectively, I don't believe we've ever considered that. Um, and, and that would be a valid contribution to the game because that was certainly an issue uh, in World War II, but uh, it would require some, some thought on the part of um, whoever currently carries the mantle of war game designer for War at Sea, um, but we, we have not done so, no. So another question I got is, uh, what was one of the core principles behind designing War at Sea in its current format? Well, I think, I mean, I think to really to answer that question, the, the, the primary principles were um, the slide that I showed several ago, which listed operational art concepts, and then it also listed naval warfare concepts. Um, those principles and the sum aggregation of those concepts and the body of knowledge represented by that slide really are the core of what War at Sea was designed to teach our students and um, you know, further their understanding of. Over. 
So there's another question that says uh, to elaborate on how you guys came up with the combat result tables. So you showed that table with the, the dashes and the ones and the one D6s uh, for submarine torpedo attacks. Uh, were the combat result tables calibrated to historical or models and simulation data? Uh, great question. So um, we did attempt to um, link them to uh, official historical data. Um, we didn't do modeling and simulation, uh, to my knowledge, although it's possible that, that uh, Larry, who mainly came up with the primary uh, results of those tables, it's possible that he did do some modeling, um, but it was based more on a qualitative assessment of, of reading the historical record than it was a quantitative assessment uh, of calculating, um, you know, priorities, or excuse me, calculating um, outcomes. I would like to add, you know, some can argue that a, a die six and the, the gradation between the different rolls of a die six, which is about 16%, is not, it's not specific enough to be accurate for combat. And, and I think there is probably some validity to that argument, um, but I would argue that, and this gets to one of the, the key precepts in uh, war game design, historical accuracy versus playability and complexity. And I would argue that we were historically accurate enough to make the results believable without being bogged down in um, you know, hyper-specific details. Over. So I got a clarification on uh, an earlier question about the core principles driving the design. They were asking, what were some of the constraints of the classroom, about your curriculum, about the number of facilitators that may have driven some of the design choices? Because you know, educational war games are under different constraints than, let's say, analytical war games, where you can have them for five full straight days. Uh, what are some of the considerations you guys had to bake into your design of war at sea? Um, so... I'll touch upon a little of that now, and I'm also going to touch uh, upon that a little more in my formal remarks uh, in the last third of my talk. But but some considerations, some constraints that we had. Um, typically, we teach with somewhere between 16 to 18 seminars, and each seminar, as I said, has two moderators. Um, so one constraint was training enough facilitators and moderators and umpires to be able to run all those games basically on the same day. Now, we didn't achieve that. In fact, we developed a model where we would play half those games on one day, where moderators on one day would then on the next day be the act as facilitators. So we ended up achieving you know, gameplay by splitting it in half. Um, other considerations include the fact that a typical class session is three and a half hours. So we designed the game to be played from beginning to end in about three and a half hours. A typical turn of the game takes about 30 minutes. And so in three and a half hours, if you assume a slightly slow start and you assume um, some, some comments at the end, you're gonna get approximately six turns in three and a half hours. And six turns is actually a pretty good um, amount of time to achieve the educational outcomes. Another huge constraint, and this affected how we train facilitators, it affected how complex we felt the rules can be, was the time available to faculty to learn the game. Because the JMO faculty are teaching two out of three semesters. And that third semester, frankly, is spent prepping for the other two. We had to be very conscious in terms of how complex was the game? Was it too complex to try, to try and train all of our faculty to be able to use it? Um, and, and I would argue that that led to some simplifications in the game and probably ultimately made it a better game. Lastly, one consideration that 
I believe I touched on briefly later on. Another consideration was just achieving faculty buy-in to use the game in the classroom. And that was a long struggle. Uh, and eventually we were able to convince the preponderance of the faculty that it would be beneficial and it would be effective in the classroom. Um, and, and I would argue that, that that aspect, the PR campaign to allow adoption of the war game in the classroom was probably one of the biggest constraints on our time as the war game designers and developers. Over. So I have no more questions, Christoph, but so you can press on. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Sebastian. So I've stressed from the beginning that War at Sea is an educational war game. The game must serve the needs of the students. It must serve the needs of the curriculum. Now, to ensure that success, everything outside of the game itself should be aligned to its inclusion in the classroom. Now this slide shows the process that we implemented in our curriculum, our curricula, excuse me, to support War at Sea. And so this is basically what we need to do accomplish over several days to allow the war game to be successful. At some point in advance of playing the game, you needed to spend some time in the classroom preparing them for the game and teaching them some of the basic game mechanics. Whether that is an orientation event or whether that is bringing various pieces and parts of the game into the classroom earlier, just to make the students familiar with the cups of dice uh, and, and some of the artifacts uh, that are used in the game. There needed to be some preparation of those basic war game mechanics in advance. Now, the next thing is, and this step here, actually the next several steps don't change whether the war game is being used or not. But the next step is, okay, the students need to conduct whatever reading they have to read about the academic concepts that we're trying to teach them. So they'll conduct some reading to introduce those concepts. And then they'll conduct other reading that highlights those concepts in the case study. I can't stress enough. If students don't do the reading and don't understand the concepts, academically, cognitively, before you play the war game, no amount of playing that war game will teach them those concepts. So the war game is used to build upon that basic level of knowledge to highlight some aspects uh, of those academic concepts. So the students do the reading and then they come into seminar and the moderator leads a seminar discussion, typically to ensure the student understanding of those concepts and then also to delve into the historical case study to highlight those concepts. Now, once that is done and once the moderators feel that the students understand all of those concepts, we have the students conduct what we call operational art analysis. Now, typically this involves the students going back into that case study in teams and targeting their efforts and their reading of the case study to understand time, space, and force, and how those factors impact the military situation, to understand the, center, the centers of gravity of the combatants, to determine the strengths and weaknesses and the relative combat power of both one side's military forces and the other side's military forces. We try and have the students spend time understanding the objectives of both combatants. And all of this together is what we call operational art analysis. Now that image that I have on the screen there is what is uh, an outcome of that op art analysis. The students will through discussion and working together, typically write down the results of their analysis 
and they'll put it on this big butcher block paper and they'll hang it on the wall in the classroom. Now, why do they do that? They do that because they're then gonna have to brief that analysis to the moderator and to the members of the other team. And again, that's a way to uh, cement those concepts in their mind. And it's a way for the moderator to ensure that the students have a good understanding, both of those academic concepts and the historical basis that that case study provides. We then ask the teams to develop an operational idea. Now an operational idea is basically a plan to achieve a military objective based upon the operational analysis that they've just conducted. So for instance, the American team in the Battle of Leyte Gulf is given the objective to stage a successful landing in the Philippines, move their forces ashore, and then establish the conditions to commence a follow-on invasion of the entire Philippines archipelago. By contrast, the military objective of players on the Japanese team might be to either one, prevent that landing, or two, effectively repulse that landing or deal with the potential outcomes of that land. So each team will develop an operational idea, and then they will brief that operational idea to the rest of the class. So to that opposing team and to the moderators. Members from the other team and the moderators will critique that operational idea, will question why did they decide this? Why did they decide that? And it's a give and take. It's a, it's a very powerful discussion in the classroom. And as I said, all of those steps that I've just discussed happen whether or not the war game is used by an instructor. Now, the next step, if we choose to use the war game, the next step is that the seminar will conduct the war game. Now, in this case, typically, the two teams will not brief out their operational idea to the other team because that operational idea is their plan to win the war game. So typically that brief would happen later, but the war game is conducted. And as I said, typically three and a half to four hours, um, but an important, point, an important point to make on that. If you play a game for four hours, at least any of the war at sea scenarios that we've developed or that I've seen developed elsewhere, Four hours is never enough time to actually lead to a conclusive victory by one side or the other. It's just not enough time. Now, some players get frustrated by this, but my pushback on that frustration would be the education that you're deriving from this activity does not depend on whether you win or lose. The win or the loss contributes to the fun. And it might allow you some bragging rights in the seminar, but achieving a win or a loss does not contribute to the education. And I would argue in some cases can actually detract from that education. So once the war game is complete, perhaps the most important aspect of including a war game as an educational tool is the war game debrief after the fact. And as I said, the moderator during the game is recording the events of the game and tracking the decisions made by the players. And then at the debrief, you get to talk about, you sit down with both players, with both teams. Typically, if you're able, you allow them to see the game maps. And again, this will be the first time that they actually get to see their opponent's game map after the game is done. And the moderator will lead a discussion Team X, why did you do this? Why did you violate your plan? Or perhaps, why did you stick to your plan when it seemed like your plan was failing? And again, that debrief is the opportunity for the moderator to stress all of the concepts that were previously academically introduced in the readings. Those operational art concepts, those naval warfare concepts, in the hands of an effective moderator, this debrief 
will allow those students to make connections between what they saw in the game and the concepts that they learned about academically. Now this model as indicated on this screen has proven to be very effective and has been and is replicated elsewhere. So I would argue that it's a pretty good system that, that we built. Now, again, I would say these bullets that I've highlighted in blue are aspects of this plan that would occur whether or not the war game was played. So I just want that to be clear to all of our viewers. I want to briefly touch upon the educational underpinnings of wargaming in the classroom. Now, most educators probably will be familiar with this chart that I'm showing on the screen right now. Many who are not educators, perhaps not. But this is Bloom's taxonomy of educational outcomes. We could spend hours merely talking about this chart itself. But effectively, what it is attempting to demonstrate to you is various things that a student is able to do based on activities in the classroom. Now, I would argue to you that depending on the instructor and depending on the classroom, every one of those things from bottom to top can be accomplished in a classroom setting. Typically, the higher up that pyramid you go, the more difficult it is to achieve in the classroom. Um, remembering and understanding often can come from discussion and reading. And if you're a smart student, you read and you can remember and understand. Typically, an in-class activity will allow you to apply what you've learned, and sometimes homework assignments, for instance, will allow you or will test your ability to apply what you've learned, what you've remembered, and what you've understood. Above application is analyzing, and then above that is evaluating and creating. All six of those potential educational outcomes can be achieved in the classroom. I would argue, however, that by employing wargaming in the classroom, it is easier to achieve those higher educational outcomes. It is most certainly, I would argue, easier to apply what you've learned in a war game setting where you are literally forced to apply what you've learned by making decisions that affect the outcome of that game. I would also argue that analysis through the lens of the war game, both in playing the game and in that debrief after the game, is very easily done in this type of environment. But why? What is it about war games that do this? What is it about war at sea that makes me so confident that war gaming allows the achievement of these higher order items on Bloom Taxonomy? I would argue it's this. Educators have determined there are effectively three domains of learning. I would argue that a well-designed war game and war at sea are effective because they tap into all three of these domains of learning. And these three domains were purposely kept in mind by Tim throughout the development process because he understood the power of these three domains. You have the cognitive domain. You're just thinking about it. It's, it's your brain figuring out what you need to understand. But the war game, the use of dice, rolling the dice, the use of moving those cups across the table, the use of considering by standing around a table and looking at items on a table and the movement of those real world items, 
that feeds into the psychomotor domain. And if you can involve physical activity in your learning, it has been proven that you will learn more effectively. And so Word C was designed to tie into that psychomotor domain. And I'm gonna pause here for a slight aside. This is one reason why we feel very strongly, perhaps I should say I feel very strongly, that a tabletop physical game is in many cases better than a virtual or computer-based game. Because I believe that manipulating those dice, manipulating those cups, manipulating some of the game artifacts that I haven't spoken to you about this evening, that manipulation contributes to your understanding of the concepts for which you're manipulating those things. And then lastly, the effective domain, the emotional domain. If you have an emotional connection to what you're trying to learn, it is proven that you will learn it better. And for many of us, certainly for many military service members, the opportunity to win or lose contributes to that emotional connection to that game. Playing a game is fun, it gets people's juices flowing, and therefore it ties into that effective domain and the results of that war game will be more effectively drilled into the heads of your students because of it. I wanna very briefly touch on where is war at sea now and where is it going? To that point, and the very first line I have, the Frungs Academy. And the Frungs Academy is the German Command and Staff College located in Hamburg, Germany. Now, to be fair, any well-rounded and full discussion of war at sea has to include the Frungs Academy. And the reason is this. Members of the faculty of the Frungs Academy came to the Naval War College about six to eight months into our design effort, and we showed them War at Sea. And they immediately saw the value in this war game as an educational tool for Naval officers. And so the members of that faculty worked very closely with us over the next year and a half to two years, and they, imported War at Sea to Germany, and they, in fact, were using it in their coursework before we were using it in our coursework at the Naval War College. This led to a whole, a whole host of advantages for both institutions. They were able to come up with streamlines to the rules, additional, um, additional modalities that we can employ the game with. Uh, they contributed to its development over time. They contributed to our understanding of how, game, how, how good the game could be. The Frungs Academy was absolutely an equal partner in the development of this game. I was lucky enough uh, to travel to Germany several times to help them learn the game and then use the game in their course. And, and I believe even today, the military faculty at the Prungas Academy believes in War at Sea more than a good percentage of the faculty at the Naval War College does. And I hope that that continues. Uh, War at Sea, again, early in our development cycle, uh, we conducted an exchange with the Army War College and a group of faculty from the Naval War College traveled down to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which is where the Army War College is located. And we presented War at Sea to them. And they were very intrigued by the game. And they, in fact, uh, asked for all the rules, all the documentation, which we were able to give them. And they created their own land-based game 
called Joint Overmatch Euro Atlantic, based on the general mechanics that we had pioneered in War at Sea. So I was very proud of that, and, and I helped them with that effort to some extent. Uh, and having been an alumni of the Army War College, it was nice to get back and share with them uh, the game and know that, that they use it, and they use it to this day in their curriculum. War at Sea has also, uh, to some extent, been exported to, uh, to Japan. Um, several Japanese students have attended the War College and its International Introduction to Wargaming course, which is held by the Wargaming Department. And they use it to teach military officers from other institutions, from other navies around the world, the power of wargaming, the benefits of wargaming, and to some extent, but to a lesser extent, how to conduct wargame design and development. The wargaming department uses War at Sea to teach that course, and they have shared that obviously with personnel from the JMSDF, and those personnel have taken the game back to Japan with them. And then lastly, I would point out the Naval Academy. Um, through Sebastian, I was able to get back in touch with some faculty at the Naval Academy. And we have created a game set for them. And the midshipmen in the new wargaming extracurricular activity at the Naval Academy have been playing War at Sea fairly regularly. Uh, I had an opportunity a few months ago to, to go back and, and, and teach them how to play the game. The midshipmen, good on them. We're trying to play the game purely based on reading the rules and watching the videos. Uh, so I was able to go back and assist them and I'll be doing that again uh, come the new year. So I have talked for an hour and a half now and technically this is a two hour event. There were several other topics that I could have discussed and could have built slides for, but I didn't. Um, and some of those topics include hurdles to adoption, include the challenges of training our facilitators, uh, include some more in-depth information on how we coordinate with some of those other institutions. Um, and, and I'm willing to take questions on any of those topics or anything else. Um, but if I had had more time, those are topics that I would cover. And I would also highly recommend that um, Sebastian get somebody from the Farooz Academy to talk about War at Sea from their perspective. And it just so happens that there is an American exchange officer who was there when we taught them, and he would be the perfect person to give a follow-on lecture to the Georgetown University Wargaming Society about War at Sea from the German perspective. And I have one more slide, and I'm gonna go there now. And that is this, and you can see at the bottom, the link to the YouTube channel that contains those instructional videos. If any of the viewers are interested in watching those videos, they are there in that channel. And with that, Sebastian, I just wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak to your group tonight. Uh, I've enjoyed it, and I hope your audience has gotten something out of this. And so now I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, Nick, appreciate the wonderful presentation. I have a couple of questions that I've received, but I am going to jump in line because I am the facilitator and I get to do stuff like that. So my uh, first question is actually on exactly one of the things that you said uh, you would have covered, which is some of the hurdles to adoption and implementation. Uh, obviously, I'm very interested at, uh, with uh, the efforts here at Georgetown and other uh, PME institutions like the U.S. Naval Academy and Marine Corps University. So what were some of the hurdles uh, to adoption and how did you get over them? So I think the, the first and biggest hurdle by far is time. And, and by time, frankly, I mean five or six different things. So, so let, me, let me run through a couple of those. First, time to design the game. As you can imagine, it took a lot of time. 
a, a lot of time play testing, a lot of time um, doing the initial research, a lot of time building the components, a lot of time creating the maps, creating all of the documentation, time creating the, um, the instructional videos. It was a huge investment in time. Uh, time by me, by Tim Pallage, by Larry Johnson, by those other members of the JMO department who assisted us, by those members of the Wargaming department who assisted us, by those members of the Froings Academy who assisted us. Merely the time to create the game and all of its artifacts and all of the quote unquote pieces parts. That's one aspect of time. A second aspect of time is teaching the game to the faculty of the War College. Not a trivial amount of time. Importantly, and this is a valid concern that was raised by many members of the faculty, if they are spending time learning this war game, they are not spending time brushing up on their lesson plans, doing additional readings to make them more knowledgeable of the academic concepts that we teach so they can better contribute to the student's educational understanding purely in the seminar setting. Time that they can't work on their own special projects. Time that they can't contribute to their own professional development. So there's time spent in training the faculty. There's also time in the curriculum itself. Both the junior and senior course at the War College are approximately 14 weeks long. So to include, and not only that, 14 weeks long, but a controlled number of contact hours that is not controlled by the faculty in the JMO department, but it is controlled by the War College. The War College tells the department, you have these 14 weeks and you are going to have this number of contact hours, meaning this number of classroom hours to teach your course. So if we are going to play a war game that's three and a half hours, plus an hour or two teaching students mechanics in advance of that war game, plus an hour debrief after the war game, that five, six, seven, eight hours to play one war game is eight hours that have to come out of that set limit of hours allotted to the department by the college. As you can imagine, finding hours to do that while still meeting all of the educational objectives that the course requires is difficult. And again, I have to go back to and harp on the importance of those educational objectives. If those educational objectives are, being, are not being met, there is zero value in having the war game. So by choosing to have the war game, you need, you being the faculty, need to ensure that you can still meet all of those other educational objectives. Finally, not finally, an additional factor of time is training the facilitators. I'll be very honest with you, Sebastian, training a moderator to be able to use the war game as a tool in the classroom uh, is a certain level of war game mechanics understanding. Teaching that same moderator how to facilitate that war game and understand all the intricacies of the rules and understand all the different functions of the artifacts of the game that's probably double or more of a time commitment that was required just to teach that moderator how to use it as a tool in his classroom. So time is by all means the largest hurdle to adoption uh, of this war game. And I believe, I believe any war game in any educational setting. To a lesser extent, a constraint is cost, the monetary cost of the game and all its artifacts. 
you know, we spoke earlier about the cost of plastic dice. Well, you buy a couple thousand, enough for many, many game sets, an individual die is not so expensive. If you only buy a couple hundred, enough for one game set, they are expensive. In addition, buying plastic tiles, uh, on the screen there, you can see those brass rings, buying brass rings, uh, printing the game maps. Luckily for the War College, printing a full color 48 by 60 inch game map is not very expensive because the War College has its own printing press and its own printing and graphic shop. However, if you want to print that same game map and, and deliver it as I did, for instance, to the Naval Academy, or to another institution, printing that game map at a Kinko's or at a office mate could run you 150 or $175. And a game requires two of those. So monetary cost is also a hurdle to implementing the game. And I could go on and on, but I think those two, time cost and monetary cost, are probably two of the two biggest, Sebastian. So another question we have is, is it possible to get a hold of copy of the rules outside of a full set of game or a full set of the game? Uh, I would say absolutely. If, if somebody wants a copy of the rules, um, we can email the PDF of those rules upon request. Who should they email? Should they just email you or the Naval War College? Now that's a great question. I'll tell you, again, back to my disclaimer at the beginning of this talk, I have no formal connection to the Naval War, Naval War College at this time. I have several um, personal connections and I, am, I have volunteered to assist them to continue the development of the game going forward, but I don't have a formal connection to them. So I believe the best bet would be to email them. And I believe, Sebastian, you have some contact information for some of my former colleagues at the War College. So I would tell your viewing audience, email you, and you can then pass on their requests to personnel at the War College. And if, if I am incorrect and you don't have that contact information, Sebastian, you can pass that on those requests on to me, and I will pass them on to the War College. Um, yeah, so I have some contacts I will share. Let me confirm really quickly if I can share those in the chat. Uh, otherwise, you can reach out to the Georgetown University of Wargaming Society email, which is goose at georgetown.edu, uh, G-U-W-S at georgetown.edu, and we will uh, forward you to the, uh, one of our U.S. Naval War, Naval War College colleagues who can help you with either building your own set or getting access or anything uh, related to War SC. Uh, so one of the other questions that we have here is, uh, have you built scenarios in this game that are not historically based, say Taiwan, South China Sea, Straits of Hormuz scenarios, and so forth? I know at least uh, you guys have gone up to the Falklands, correct? Uh, yes. So to answer that question, we have. Uh, we've built a Falkland scenario, which, which is historical. Uh, we've built one... Um, modern day fictional scenario um, that effectively models a South China Sea-like conflict, um, although it does not take place in the South China Sea. Uh, it models modern US naval combatants versus modern um, People's Liberation Army Navy combatants from China. Um, and we have, uh, the, the Farungas Academy has actually modeled a couple different scenarios. And uh, the War College is considering modeling a few more new ones in the coming months and years. So we have built the rules to model modern day scenarios, fictional scenarios. And uh, you know I'd be quite happy to assist in development of modern day scenarios uh, for War at Sea. So on that note, what were some of the challenges you guys faced when you guys were trying to have 
uh, the game system both address historical World War II to all the way up to the Falklands. What are some of the adaptations or challenges you guys had in design? Great question, great question. And another thing that if I'd had more time, I would have hit upon in my formal comments. Um, so there were three or four major rules changes that we had to make in transitioning from World War II era combat to, um, to 1980s era combat. And in fact, what we did, we basically split the rules document into basic rules, which covers World War II era, intermediate rules, which are more complex, take into account more aspects of naval warfare for the Cold War slash 1980s era combat, and advanced rules, which take into account you know, modern day capabilities and modern day um, weapon systems, et cetera, et cetera. So in making the transition from World War II era combat to 1980s era combat, a couple of things that we had to model, the use of radar and the use of uh, emissions control, the use of satellites, all of those things affect the ability to detect your opponent and the ability to be detected by your opponents. And those aspects absolutely played a role in the Falklands Mall Venus conflict. So we felt that we needed to model them. And we did, and they do affect gameplay. Um, another thing that we modeled was the widespread adoption of missiles. Missiles on board uh, ships, on board aircraft, not something we really modeled in uh, World War II era. Had to be modeled in uh, the Falkland scenario. And because we decided to model missiles, we made a decision to make them be expendable. So one major difference between a cup of dice from the Leyte Golf scenario and a cup of dice from the Falkland scenario is that in Leyte Golf, we don't deal with logistics at all. We don't deal with the fact that in the real world, a ship could run out of shells and no longer be able to engage in combat. We didn't model that in the World War II era rules. The basic rules assume that over the length of whatever scenario you're playing, all the forces maintain, you know, maintain the ability to employ all of their weapons. In the Falklands era, where we're talking about Ma missile magazines with limited numbers of missiles, and we're talking torpedoes, or excuse me, submarines with limited number of torpedoes, we instituted expendable munitions. So in Leyte, you're gonna roll the same dice that you roll the entire game until your opponent starts eliminating your dice. In the Falklands and in the modern day rules, a certain portion of your dice if they are expendable missiles or if they represent torpedoes, you will roll the die and then you lose it. So whether you hit or miss, by, by choosing to employ some number of torpedoes, you will have to roll a die. And if you roll poorly, your torpedoes miss and that die goes away, never to come back again. Unless you can drive your submarine back to port and you can stock up on those torpedoes. So expendable munitions was a rule change that we had to take into account in the transition from World War II to uh, Cold War era. The other major change we made is we included the tracking of fuel. So in the Falkland scenario, we introduced the, the use of oilers. If you don't occasionally top up your fuel levels of all your combatants, you can very quickly run out of fuel. And if you run out of fuel, you're dead in the water. As you can imagine, that contributes a whole, an additional level of complexity to how to player decision-making 
to how they're going to prosecute their, their targets to how they're going to drive around the ocean. So radar and emissions control, satellites, expendable munitions, and logistics were all some of the rules that we had to institute in the intermediate rules that didn't exist in the basic rules for the World War II era games. Over. So another question asks, do you feel the advent or ubiquity of computer-based models and sims raises the bar in terms of what is expected out of a war game? I've experienced skepticism when I pulled out a dice of D6 or dice. Well, um, that's a great question. I'll, I'll tell you what. So when we, for instance, when we were trying to convince the faculty at the War College to play a war game, one of the things that we purposely decided to do was only include six-sided dice in the game because everybody at some point in their life has rolled a six-sided die. Whether it's a board game growing up as a kid or whatever, everybody's familiar with dice. Um, on the other hand, we purposely made the decision not to include other polyhedral dice, dice with four sides or eight sides or 10 sides or 12 sides or 20 sides. Um, because we anticipated and experienced pushback from people who, from very well-meaning, very professional faculty members of the JMO department, who just couldn't imagine rolling a die other than a six-sided die. Now, to the point of whether or not a six-sided or a tabletop game is more effective or not than a computer game, or is more easily or not adopted than a computer game, I would argue that if presented with that, Wargaming has been going on for centuries, and computers in wargaming have only been used in the last 25 years. And wargaming, analog wargaming, has enough strengths with it that you're just going to need to overcome the, the, the pushback from people who scoff at rolling dice as opposed to using a computer. And I will go one step further, and, and I didn't touch on this earlier. I would argue that at least in the case of an educational war game, it's better than a computer. I don't want players getting sucked into their screen and a keyboard. I don't want players clicking a mouse, pressing buttons to see what happens on their screen. Because every minute that a player is looking at his screen or clicking his mouse is a minute that he's not talking to his teammates, getting into a debate about the military value of this action or that action, questioning what is our opponent going to do. I am a firm believer in the social aspect of gaming and the social aspect of a seminar style classroom and the importance of that socialization on the education. Over. So one of our last questions that we have is, were you able to prove that a student learning was better versus with or without wargaming, thinking something like an experiment where you guys had cases. Um, you mentioned that not all the seminars did the wargaming of war SC. Um, I know that's pretty contentious, but uh, I'll throw that question out. I think prove, you know, the question was, were you able to prove that the educational outcome employing a war game was better? Um, I think prove is a very, very high bar to achieve. And I would, I would admit, no, I don't believe we proved it. 
I would say that we have vast amounts of anecdotal evidence in terms of, of course critiques, course surveys, surveys of the students immediately after playing the game, of hearing from students who didn't play the game but heard about it and wish they had been able to. Um, there is a vast body of qualitative anecdotal evidence that points to the value of the wargaming. But did we prove it? I don't, I don't feel confident enough to say that we met that academic bar. Now, I, I will tell you, for somebody who is looking for proof, there have been numerous academic studies that talk about the efficacy of wargaming in education. And so while, no, I can't say that we proved it with war at sea, I can point to any number of academic studies that prove the concept in general terms. Over. As we're approaching the end of our uh, webinar, I'll give a few more minutes for last people, uh, people to put last minute questions. But one of the last questions that we like to ask our speaker this year in 2021 uh, is if you had unlimited funds, unlimited time, and all the organizational hurdles like opened up for you, what is a war game or a project that you would like to do in the future? That's a great question, Sebastian. And, and I'll be very honest with you. If I had the time and the money and, um, you know, the, the freedom to pursue wargaming, what I would do is continue to design more and varied scenarios for war at sea. Um, you know, one aspect we didn't touch on was there are certain drawbacks to using the Battle of Leyte Gulf as an introductory scenario to war at sea. Um, I would pick several other World War II era battles and engagements and create scenarios for them. And in fact, one of our faculty at the War College did create another World War II era scenario. I would create a scenario for the Battle of Midway. I would create a whole bunch of scenarios for war at sea. And frankly, you know, the ultimate vision in my mind is I would share war at sea with every naval war college in the world. I would share war at sea with every Navy training command, every American Navy training command that exists. Because the basic mechanics that, that we have designed, I believe education at the operational level of war, war at sea right now does that. As we alluded to earlier, I can make uh, tactical versions of war at sea that use the same mechanics, the same dice, the same dice colors to teach tactical educational um, items. And I believe, you know, the, the continuum of, hey, I play war at sea or a war at sea like game at the Naval Academy as a midshipman and I learn the mechanics and I learn the colors. And then I graduate from the Naval Academy and I go to service warfare officers school where they use a game that was based on war at sea and it uses the same colors and it uses the same dice and it uses the same mechanics. And I learn how to be a service warfare officer by using this offshoot of war at sea. And then six years later, I go back to the Naval War College and I play war at sea again. And three years later, I'm in another training command out in the Navy and lo and behold, we're using war at sea to teach other educational outcomes. And then I go back to the Naval War College again five years later as a captain, and I play War at Sea again. And each time you play this game, I can focus on different educational outcomes. I can focus on different aspects of that game to teach you, the student, different things. You know, in my mind, the goal is War at Sea everywhere, all the time. I love it. You know what I mean? I love educational wargaming. 
uh, to a fault at times. So, you know, those, that is just music to my ears personally. Um, so to speak about War of Sea a little bit as we close, there are some great mechanics in this game as a designer, uh, both uh, for the classroom, but you know, just to learn about like one of the clever mechanics that you can sort of see in the photo is you can add dice on top to ready them for either doing cap or doing strike. It, it's such an interesting little, uh, and then use brass rings to indicate search areas for ISR. So if you can just go to the YouTube page, go through all the videos. It's, uh, it's a great exercise in learning types of uh, different, different types of mechanics. Uh, so I don't see any questions. So lastly, I would like to thank our speaker, Nick, uh, for presenting such an insightful and um, helpful um, webinar on War SC used at the Naval War College. Uh, and hopefully you guys can find the recording if you miss any portion of this at our YouTube page at um, for, for Georgetown University War Gaming Society. Otherwise, thank you everyone for uh, spending your Tuesday evening with us. And ho hopefully we'll see you in the next year. Um, with our new webinar series, which will be moving to bi-weekly. Uh, so we'll be only doing about two a, uh, a month uh, moving forward in 2022. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.